Uh, well, thanks very much. It's a it's a real it's a real honor, also a real challenge to speak in front of such audience. And so my talk will be about well, you can you can, you're all literate. You can uh, enumerative geometry and geometric representation theory as a part of panorama of mathematics. And um, so what is enumerative geometry? It's, it's a complicated subject, but maybe uh, so that you get some minimal feel about it. Let's go for the first, first computation students do when they start the subject. So, so in, in, in algebraic geometry, there are countably many questions of the following kind. So if I give you uh, some algebraic variety and I fix uh, some degree in genus, some degree d and genus g, then how many curves of degree d and genus g meet such and such cycles? Such as, for example, here's an example with algebraic variety is a plane. A degree is a degree, I'll take three. What does it mean? Uh, uh, if I have a curve in a plane, it's defined by one equation, so the degree of that equation will be three. So, uh, and as a genus, I'll take zero. And what does it mean to, for curve to be genus zero? Well, it means it, it can be parameterized by a rational function. And one of the first things you learn about uh, plane curves is that uh, a cubic curve is rational if and only if it has a singularity, as indicated by that arrow. The arrow in the picture points to a singularity. And so, and so if I look at cubic curves, uh, they're just given by the coefficient of the defining equations, and there's nine, so it's a nine-dimensional uh, nine space. Meeting uh, a given point is a linear equation, so I impose eight I want them to meet eight points, so I impose eight linear equations in nine-dimensional space. I get a line worth of cubic. That would be that pencil that, uh, you know, I imagine some of you paid attention in Paul Zeidel's talk. His talk was about Lefschetz's pencil. That is the pencil. And so, um, and, so, and so you get a one parameter family of cubics, and the question is, well, how many of them are singular? How many of them are rational? And uh, a very classical computation, again, this was, uh, this was expl <laughs> again, again, if you paid attention to Paul talk, you know the answer is 12. It, it's, it's one of the first computations when the answer is not 0, not 1, not even 2, but 12. So you can, you, you, if you want, you can print a calendar in which for every month there will be a one, 1 cubic. And so, um, so uh, and you can imagine things get uh, quite a bit more complicated. For example, that same, uh, you can ask a similar question. If I take rational curves of degree d, meeting 3d minus one point in, in general position, how many of them there are going to be? And, and, and so this would be the answer to this is given by the sequence. First, in complete generality determined by Kansevich, you say if you take degree one, that means I meet how many lines are there through two points. Okay, Euclid, Euclid tells us it's exactly one. If I take two, asking how many Conics go through five points. Again, the answer is one. Twelve, we just did. And then it gets much more complicated. Uh, so, um, and there's another popular sequence. This is original. This is the original mirror, mirror of geometry prediction about uh, rational curves and Calabi Yaus. And, uh, uh, well, certainly there's many, many names should be mentioned in, in this context, but if I want to put one, maybe it's Kiventhal. And so, uh, and, and the numerative geometry is about bringing some order into this zoo of numbers. And the numbers, these are very complicated numbers, and the, the order in which is very complicated too. And so it's a land of, 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 of very complicated formulas, and, uh, uh, which, which, which will essentially spare you in, entirely in this talk. I'll just give you, you, know, it's, you can imagine the, whatever formulas produce these numbers must be pretty complicated. Uh, so, um, but, but you, should, you, should, you should imagine that what we really do in our day jobs is we, we, we compute, we do very complicated computations. Uh, but well, I'll, try, I'll try to just wave my hands around it. So, um, so uh, the problem we just did about, uh, about a rational cubics through eight points, of course, you should choose eight points to be in general position, and this is uh, one of the first things you learn in, in numerical geometry, that uh, you, get, you get good count if you put things in general position. And you, can, you don't have to go very far for examples. You can start with lines through two points. If the two points are distinct, there is one line. If the two points, in fact, happen to be the same point, then, then, then of course, there is a whole pencil, this whole P1 worth of line going through these two points. 
And so, and so like, as I said, the first thing you learn is you should put things in general position to count things correctly. But then, of course, the second thing, the next thing they'll tell you immediately that, that you shouldn't be a slave of, of a general position for, for any number of reasons because, well, it, it's quite obvious you shouldn't really, you should be able to uh, uh, compute not in general position. Well, because it's very hard to compute in general position. Any, any sort of computation you want to do, you start, well, let's put them in special positions. Something special will happen, and then that, that gets us going. And that's uh, also, uh, general position is an enemy of uh, any symmetry. If you want, if you want, uh, you have a group acting, and you want to uh, take your group action into account, then, uh, then, uh, then there's no way to put, to put things in general position so that it, it's, also, so it's also group invariant. And so, uh, well, you imagine there should be a way to count solutions even when they're not isolated. And, uh, well, I'll tell you the answer, what the right answer, I think, is. But before we discuss the right answer, you think, well, maybe, maybe what I should be doing is to compute, just take these solutions that compute its other characteristic. Uh, that, that fails very badly in the very first example. So if I take, <laughs> I'll just, just going to go through this again. So if I take lines through two points, and two points are the same, then I get P1, P1 worth of, of lines going through this one point. If I work with real coefficient, the other characteristic of the projective line is zero. If I work with complex coefficient, the other characteristic of projective line is two. In neither case, I get the correct answer, which is, should be one. Well, of course, you, you, you'll observe that what one would be the holomorphic Euler characteristic of, of a projective line. Namely, so a projective line is algebraic variety, has a sheaf of regular functions, holomorphic functions. That, uh, that sheaf has one global section, namely the constant function, and it has no hierarchy homology, which, is, uh, which is amounts to saying that there are no holomorphic differentials on, 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 on P1, on projective line. And so if you take dimension of, all the characteristic means you take the dimension of zero cohomology, the alternating sum of dimension of cohomology, so you take one minus zero, get one, which is right answer. Well, in this case, we just a little bit got lucky because in general, the general answer is that you have a, you impose your, you have some moduli problem for, for objects you want to enumerate. You uh, impose your enumerative condition and the geometry of the objects you're trying to enumerate with the enumerative condition, what they do is they define a certain coherent sheaf, a certain sheaf on this topological space, in this case on P1. And, and what you should be doing is computing the, the holomorphic one. The Euler characteristic of algebraic geometry is just the Euler characteristic of that sheaf. So that, that sheaf is roughly, it's, it's roughly, like fun, roughly like regular functions, or holomorphic functions, so meaning it is a coherent sheaf. And it's a very, very standard thing in algebraic geometry to associate, to take a sheaf with computed Euler characteristics. So that's, and if you, if, you, uh, if you ask a problem like this, then, uh, then it has great many advantages in that, uh, well, first of all, if, uh, if you have some symmetry, so you see <coughs> this Euler characteristic is alternating sum of dimensions with certain vector spaces. And so in particular, if you have some symmetry, some group acting, that the group will act on all these spaces. So you're going to get alternating sum of representations of some group. So a virtual representation of some group. You get a richer information than, than just the dimension. And that, uh, so, so this, this, this group, uh, the information of the group action, this is what it means to, this is somehow a technical term for this, it means uh, mean doing an uh, enumerative recurrent case here, but that, this is what, it, what this means. And also, if you ask a problem like this, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, impose just the right number of conditions. So if you, when we were talking about uh, rational curves through eight points, eight is exactly the right number if you ask for seven, there'll be infinitely many, and if you ask for nine, there'll be nine, N none, right? So then, uh, so, but if you, if you just think of solution set and, and, and some shift that, uh, that whatever numerative condition you impose are you know, defined, so then you can take all the critics no matter what, it's, it's well defined and, and, uh, and interesting. So uh, also this Euler characteristic is, uh, has a direct interpretation as, uh, in fact, so this is, this is maybe, maybe this is the real reason we are interested in, in, in these computations, because, 
Well, I mean, it depends, of course. Mathematicians are free to study whatever they find interesting. And uh, so all this classical question in algebraic geometry, uh, they've been around for a long time, and you can, you can find them fascinating or not. But uh, the really uh, sort of new direction and new impetus comes from interpretation of exact same numbers as uh, traces of some operators over some, in fact, huge, some, some you, 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 you know, you're computing traces of some, some operators on very, very big space, but then turn out to be, to turn out to be just this, this uh, just all the characteristics of such shapes on algebraic variety, which is quite remarkable. Uh, so I hope you don't take uh, too seriously me superimposing this pencil of cubics over the tracks and bubble chamber. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, I didn't mean this nicht in ernst. So, uh, so it's, you should understand that this, this, you know, most things we study in mathematical physics, it's, they are models. They are, they are models, some aspects of, 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 of the observable universe. They don't, we're not, they're not, well, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend we, we we're going to explain standard model by, well, maybe Albrecht will disagree. So they will explain the standard model by doing this, but, but this is just models. They aspect some, they are models something, some aspect of, of physics, and they, uh, just like the two-dimensional Isaac model does model some, some aspects, so it's just another model, maybe a little bit more complicated. So, um, so okay, so this is, this is a major motivation for doing this computation. And specifically today we will talk about something called donaldson thomas theory. And um, what it does, it asks for, it's an enumerative theory of curves in, in three-dimensional manifolds. So we did, uh, we were talking about curves in the plane before, and in the plane things are in many ways simpler because in the plane, curves defined by one equation. So if you take, uh, if you take a curve in the space, then it's, it's typically not defined even by two equations. This is uh, it's a complicated thing. So, uh, for those of you who are, it's a, it's actually uh, eye-opening to many people that most curves in space are not defined by two equations. So, uh, so, uh, so for this, uh, for your ambient threefold, there's no need to assume it's Calabi Yau or anything like this. It's a, it's a common misconception to, to, uh, to be interested only in curves in Calabi Yau. Curves in just ordinary projective space, the, the, the mother of, of all three, or somehow, of all algebraic varieties, are just as interesting and as, uh, as curves in, 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 in Calabi Yau. Uh, and what makes DT theory? DT theory is how we parameterize, uh, how, we pr how we think about curves, how we parameterize curves. So uh, there must be some, to start with, you need some moduli space for the objects you want to enumerate. And uh, the way uh, DT theory approaches curves, it thinks of curves as, def as, as def equations defining them. That is to say, if you think, you know, equation defining an algebraic variety, and an uh, uh, invariant way to say it, it's uh, an ideal in the ring of functions on your threefold. So you have, a, you have some, some threefold, some algebraic variety, then whatever vanishes of that algebraic variety is an ideal in the ring of all possible functions. So you, the, this, is, this is how you think about curve. And, and one can, so in principle, one can try to really get your hands on the problem by, uh, by working with actual geometry of the Hilbert scheme, but this is, this is the, in how you think about actual geometry of the Hilbert scheme. Well, if you have an ideal that has some generators, and if you want to uh, you know, write a nearby ideal, you deform the generators, and you have to deform it in such a way that all the relations that the generators satisfy continue to be satisfied. This is some is going to give you just going to give you a description of the Hilbert scheme in the neighborhood of a given ideal but this is uh, this is you can't get really really <laughs> any such computation is uh, is uh, is, uh, is is prohibitively in most instances prohibitively complicated and uh, like for example we don't even know what the dimension of the, the simplest possible Hilbert scheme in simplest possible Hilbert schemes is so so uh, so computation direct computation in, in DT theory you know, of the kind that, uh, that one could just eyeball, prohibitively complicated, it, which is a good thing because most enumerative problems of interest do embed, in, do embed into them. So if there was some, it's good that there's some intrinsic complexity to it. And so the way to approach, the way to approach, I mean, somehow, again, you can argue there are various, there are various, uh, 
there are various uh, strategies you can employ, but uh, the, one of the most successful ones was that uh, if you want to try to, if you want to try to, I mean, if you want to count curves in threefold, you should try to break your threefold in pieces, in which, in some pieces, in which it would be easier to count curves. So maybe those of you <coughs> familiar with, uh, with, uh, uh, with maybe Chern Simon's theory in three real dimensions, then uh, you somehow Donaldson Thelma's theory aims to be something similar in, compl in, 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 in complex, it's three complex dimensions, namely in three, in three real dimensions, so you compute. Chern Simon's partition function by breaking your manifold in some standard pieces and gluing those pieces together. Something similar, albeit very much more complicated, much more complicated procedure can, can be done in, in three complex dimensions, and it's, 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 it's a real art to do that. Uh, well, we're not going to talk about how this is done because this is, you know, it's complicated and it's also quite a bit more technical. And we will just talk about the standard pieces. And the, the advantage of the standard pieces is that this can be there's, those can be analyzed by very specific means. If you have something very specific, there are some specific tools you can use to solve that problem, as opposed to facing a very general threefold about which you know essentially nothing. So, <coughs> so to define those standard pieces, we will we'll start with the, what we will need is the first of all, algebraic surface. And you can, if you'd like, you can think about the general algebraic surface. If you don't want to think about the general algebraic surface, you can just take the, just the plane C2. And, but the real supply, the actual supply for surfaces one needs is, are the so-called AN surfaces. And their, their resolution of the singularity defined by this, by this equation, xy equals z, you know, this is the equation. And what this, this thing, what the real locus of, of this uh, singular surface looks like is plotted here for n equals 2. When you resolve the singularity, instead of this, big fat singular point, you get two rational curves that uh, meet at one point. And so this is what the surface looks like. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the plane, except it has two, two, uh, two rational curves in it that meet intersect at a point. And so this is resolution of that singularity. And this is, you can define for any n, that this is the actual supply of surfaces one needs. And so once you have a surface, I can consider the following geometry. I'll take, uh, I'll take uh, a cylinder or a product of my surface with P1. I'll, I'll plot it as a cylinder. And then uh, inside, in that cylinder, I have uh, a divisor, namely my surface cross P cross infinity, so whichever I, I, you know, which I indicated by uh, strich, uh, what's this stuff? Um, anyway, so, uh, so this is the top of that cylinder is, is S, S cross infinity. And now, I, 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 if I have a curve in that, in, in that, so the, the threefold, if I have a curve in that threefold, I can look at how it intersects the divisor. Now, there are two possible situations. It can intersect the divisor in points. It doesn't have to be transverse, but it has to be zero-dimensional. It can intersect the divisor at, at points. Or there could be a whole component of the curve lying in the divisor. It's also possible. So uh, we don't want to the second part. We want just look at the open set of those curves that intersect the divisor in points. Like I said, it might be tangent. It doesn't have to be transverse. But, but it, it, the section has to be zero-dimensional. And, uh, and, and so what can we do with this, with this setup? Is Well, there's obviously a map. There's obviously a map. So if I have a curve, then I can associate to it its intersection with the divisor, which will be a bunch. So if you have a, if you have some, I means you have some equation, you have a curve, things defined by some equations, and I can impose one more equation, namely the equation of the divisor. And so that would be instead of a curve in, in threefold, I'm going to get a zero, a bunch of points or a zero-dimensional subscheme in my surface. Does that everybody may make sense to everybody. And so I have a map from my moduli problem. I have a map. And what I can do is I can try to count curves in the fibers of this map. Meaning, if I have a sheaf on my big moduli space, I can push it forward t under this map to the, to, to the moduli space of, of, so I had curves in three space, and this maps to points in the surface. So I can, if I had the sheaf upstairs, I can push it forward to, to, uh, 
to the Hilbert scheme, what well, this is, I mean, again, both things are Hilbert schemes. Hilbert scheme of curves in X maps to the Hilbert scheme of points in S. And so, so you have the sheaf upstairs, you push it forward, you get a sheaf on the, on, on, on the Hilbert scheme of points in my surface. It means I count curves in the fiber of this map. What does it mean? I count curve as they, in, in remembering how they intersect, well, the, in, which, in which fashion they intersect my surface. Meaning it could be, they could be uh, transverse intersect at some point, maybe you know, like tangent at some other point, maybe triplet tangent at some other point, and so on and so forth. This is, so if I, uh, so it's actually, uh, to use analogy from some previous talks, I don't think I can, yeah, I would be at loss to draw a parallel to the very previous talk, but the, the, the second to last talk, this was, remember Professor Shriver's talk, uh, he took a graph and he fixed a part of it as a boundary condition, and then he summed over whatever, whatever you know, somehow, with fixed boundary condition, you can then sum with whatever bounds that boundary condition. So if you have a, <laughs> this is, we also have partition function here, and if we fix boundary condition, we get a vector. If we take the partition function with given boundary condition, you get a vector in that space. I don't know if it helps or confuses. So, um, so, so now, well, you're going to ask, well, how are going <laughs> to, it's all very well, but, uh, but this, this uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, to count things, you need, you need some kind of properness, some sort of compactness, and, and, and this is okay. So this, is, this, uh, this count is okay as long as I do the following thing. Right? First, first I, uh, of course, there is no way for the intersection to remember what was the degree or the genus of the curve in the threefold. So I have to attach some label that keeps track of that, right? So if I have a, I mean, because there's, of course, obviously, uh, you know, <laughs> infinitely, infinitely many curves of infinitely many di different degrees and different genera will all intersect my surface at some point. I have to attach some label. And the way, convenient way to do it is to count the contribution of a curve with some marker, which is, uh, oh, this is, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so this is this is a, a this is a, a computer mistake here. Where is the class? So this class is I'll write I'll write it here. So that what, what's missing on that slide is the C. You think C? You take the class of that curve in the topological K theory of X. It's some lattice. So this is this is some some lattice. And so what what this remembers precisely the the degree of the genus of the curve. So this is, this, is, this is one thing. And the second thing is obviously I've, uh, again, I took an open set of, of curves that intersect uh, my divisor in points. And so this, again, this is to, to have a well-defined counting. What I need to do is I need to do, is I need to keep track of, of remember we, <laughs> we said that, um, if I have a group action, that, uh, that group action acts on all counts. And so in particular, all counts would be a representation of the group GL1, which, which stretches my P1 direction. So if I have GL1, that can just stretch the, uh, the vertical direction of that cylinder or rotate it. So it's, uh, and so then, uh, so while the, uh, so if I, if I remember how this group GL1 acts, maybe I'll, I'll denote, I denote an element in GL1 by Q, so it'll be, the result would be a series in Q. For the, each coefficient of Q will be, will be a, for each Q, the, co the, the coefficient will be a well-defined thing because all the weight spaces, we have an infinite dimensional space, all weight spaces of this action are finite dimensional. So it, it makes sense. This count is well-defined as, as long as I remember that variable Q. And so as a result, I get this, this uh, so as a result, I get this vector, which is where does it lie? It lies in, in, in K theory of this Hilbert scheme of points. And then it's a series in variables Z that keep track of the degree and genus of my curve, and the variable Q, which keep tracks of how the, of how the uh, GL1 acts on the, on, on, by stretching the vertical direction. So, so this is, again, the way to think about it is that the, this, uh, 
well, again, if, if it's the language of, so to speak, partition function from you know, two lectures ago appeals to you, it means you, I, I, I fix boundary condition, I do my sum over the interior, and then this gives me a vector in the space of all possible boundary conditions. So this is, and this vector has many different names. It's called I function, J function, the vertex, you know, so many, so many different things. So um, maybe uh, since I used V, we'll call vertex. So, uh, and this, this, this is a very, so this is a, a, a series, and that series contains a really a, a profusion of enumerative information because it, it keeps track of, of how curves of all possible degree and genus can intersect my surface in all possible ways. So this is somehow, this is, uh, if you, you, know, you, can, you can compute that series, or, anyway. There are ways to compute that series we'll discuss in a second, and if you just look at it, you'll see it's a complicated object. And, and however, quite remarkably, so this is, so, so I was gonna say two things so, about this series. The first, it, it's, uh, it's a very complex object, and it's a good thing it's a complex object, because like, I, as I said, well, without explanation, in some, you can glue general three folds out of pieces like this. So it's, it's, it, has to be, it has to be very complicated. But quite remarkably, this, can be, this object can be repackaged much more, um, much more economically. And, and the statement is that it's essentially, so maybe, maybe uh, uh, there's, there's precise statement written here, I'll say imprecise statement, is that this object is really it, it, it's like a solution of a Q difference equation with regular singularity. So it's, 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 it's something like a hypergeometric function, if you want. And, and what is the, how do, where do you get the Q difference equation? Where, where's, the, where's the difference equation? So this object is a series in Z, and the, the exponents in Z are, um, yeah, either you identify with the K-theory classes of X, or you can identify the same piece with with second homology of your surface, of the Hilbert scheme of the surface. And then, so if I have an exponent z to the c, where c is a curve class, then of course it makes sense to shift it, when you make a q shift, it makes shift to sh make it shift that monomial, well I'm, I'm pointing to, I'm pointing with my finger to the screen as if you can see it. So, uh, so it would make sense to shift that monomial by q, though something depends linearly on c. And so the way to do it is you take a, a line bundle on your on the Hilbert scheme of, of line bundle Hilp S. C is a curve on Hilp S. And so if you pair the line bundle, if you pair a line bundle with a curve, you get an integer. And so this is this says that there is, with respect to the action of peak of Hilp, this series, if you take if I if I do any of such operation, that the result is is then some matrix applied to applied to my uh, my function. So it satisfies this this, uh, this, uh, this system of, of Q difference equations. This, this, this is not the only, the only interesting part here is that this system happens to have during, of course, any function satisfies Q difference equations. You just take that function and define, you know, define F of QZ by F of Z. This will be, this will be the coefficient of your Q difference equation. It's not very interesting. But the point is that this, this Q-difference equation has regular singularity. That's an interesting part. And, and this Q-difference equation one can compute, compute in terms of, compute in terms of uh, geometric representation theory, just like I was saying. So, uh, and this, this equation achieves, it's a much more compact object than, than the, 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 whole, the whole vertex. So it achieves a much more dense backing of enumerative information. And so if I, um, if I may allow the following uh, slightly poetic analogy, which is also technical, in that you have uh, this difference equation, it's like a silkworm, and, and, and in the silkworm in relatively mechanical fashion produces a thread, which you can then use to, to uh, weave a general threefold. And so, um, does that make sense? So, yeah, no, you may or may not like worms, but uh, but certainly there is no denying uh, the usefulness of having silk worms. People risk their lives to to get hold of silk worms. 
<laughs> Curiously, just like, uh, just like with RGB, you don't really need infinitely many threads. It's enough to do just, just three, three surfaces. It's enough to do uh, A0, A1, A2. Uh, that's enough. There's just three things determine everything, but uh, just like three colors. But it's not because there's you know, not because human eye has three receptors. It's, it's, it's mainly because the cobordism in, in this complex, I mean, complex cobordism dimension three is three dimensional. So, so what I'm going to talk is I want to talk about this computation of this quantum connection. It's, and it's fact some computation works for all Nakajima varieties, not just. So this Hilbert scheme of points of ADE surfaces, there are examples of what's called Nakajima varieties. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a computation we did with, uh, with, with Andrei Smirnov. And, uh, and well, you can, you know, there's certainly uh, overwhelming uh, statistical information towards the correlation between a, a phenotype of, um, of a good mathematical physicist uh, with certain last names. So it's a... Uh, And what this thing does, what this computation does, it generalizes a, a long line of development. And so, and, uh, so it's, um, it's, which I, you know, somehow it will take a, a separate lecture course to go through that la long line of development. And this is um, a leap to K theory of something which was uh, in cohomology, it took some, some, um, uh, some years to achieve, and, and uh, there are many names associated to this. Uh, so, in cohomology, the, differential, the, com the computation of this differential equations, the way this is, um, uh, that, that certainly played a major role in, 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 many, in various developments, like all the, um, you know, if you, if you ever heard about such topics as this uh, correspondences between Donaldson, Thomas, and Graham Witten counts, they, uh, all of them go through through comparing these different transfer equations and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's, uh, like I said, it, 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 it's quite a bit of a complex topic, and, but I, um, and it, which received, uh, many people contributed to, um, to our, our current understanding of that topic, which, but I'm not going to talk about it, I'll just take, take to try to explain the result, which in some ways it may be easier to explain. Uh, so this is, this is, this is uh, another thing. Anybody who ever worked with, with uh, Q special function knows that many results are, in fact, better when you, it's easier to state when you, when you work with Q special function than you work with ordinary special function. So it's things in, in uh, same, similarly certain things are easier to sta state, I mean, harder to prove, but easier to state in K-theory as opposed to cohomology. So I'll just explain what, what's, 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 what's going on in K-theory. And, and so, to write the difference equation, you need, what does it mean the difference equation? You have a difference equation for a vector in some space. So a difference equation has to be a matrix in that space. It has to be a linear operator in the space. And so how do you write, how do you write the, so our space is the K theory of the Hilbert scheme of some surface. So how do you write an operator in that space? Well, it turns out, so this is where geometric representation theory comes in. It turns out on that space, you just, you have not just you know, some kind of limited supply of, of natural operators, but it have, you have a representation of a humongous algebraic structure, which is denoted by this, you know, I imagine most of you will, 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 uh, uh, will, uh, will feel a little bit uh, a certain uh, repulsion or maybe intimidation by the symbol, but I'll try to explain what this thing is. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so there's a huge algebra, in fact, that acts on this space. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, this already, this is why it's called Nakajima variety, that Nakajima invented those varieties so that, so that uh, big algebras act on this. And this is an even, if, if, this is an even bigger algebra than what Nakajima constructed. Uh, so, um, and so, what is this algebra? So, this algebraists very often think about their objects 
uh, by uh, saying, well, it's a deformation of something I understand. There's a certain kind of deformation of, the, of something I understand. And, and what is this deformation of? So if you look at the... Uh, I apologize. So if you look at, the, uh, at this object here, what is this? These are Laurent polynomials in two variables with values in matrices. So the n by n matrices of Laurent polynomials in two variables. In some, you know, no, nobody should be scared of that. This, this is, albeit infinite dimensional, but, but certainly very understandable Lie algebra. And it's Lie algebra just by commuting. If you have two matrices of Laurent polynomials, you can take the commutator, will be again a matrix of Laurent polynomials. So it's a Lie algebra. And 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 what this this scary so this Lie algebra would be since I have every every hat means polynomials in one more variable. So I have polynomials in two variables, I put two hats. And so uh, so so you take this Lie algebra, then you can consider associative algebra, it's called universal development algebra. It's just associative algebra with the same with the same defining relation as the relations of your Lie algebra. In Lie algebra, you have a commutator of two things equals something. You take this as the defining relation of associative algebra, you get the universal, universal development algebra. And so this thing has a remarkable deformation. And the deformation parameter here is denoted h bar. Uh, so, you know, this, this, Yeah, even dimensions are wrong for this to be a Planck constant, but uh, but it's uh, but you know, every deformation parameters we often denote h bar. Anyway, it's denoted it's denoted here by h bar. And and what's crucial about it that this is a not some not some any algebra deformation, but it's a deformation of this as a Hopf algebra. What does this mean? An algebra is a Hopf algebra when I can tensor multiply its representation. Right? If I take a representation of a group or a Lie algebra. That has tensor product, right? If a group, if a group acts on some vector space and it acts on some other vector space, it also acts in its tensor product. The same with the Lie algebra. And so this thing has this operation. So if it acts on some vector space and acts on some other vector space, it knows how to act on their tensor product. This is what it means to be Hopf algebra. However, this 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 operation is not the tensor product of modules is not commutative in the sense that if I take the tensor product of, say, if I computing, if I have a module V1 and a module V2, and I take their tensor product in a certain order, that manifest, I mean, of course, if a group acts on V1 tensor V2, it also, of course, acts on V2 tensor V1, and if I just permute the tensor factor, that's an intertwining for the group action which is not the case for, for this deformation. This is what it means to have, be a quantum group, is when it acts, when it acts on the tensor product, it acts in a way which, which, which distinguishes between the order. You can multiply tensor multiply in one order, tensor multiply in another order. You get, you do, will get, generally speaking, generally speaking, you will get an isomorphic representation, but isomorphism is not the permutation of tensor factors. It's a more complicated object. And that this more complicated object is called the braiding. So if you take, so I imagine, so right now I'm interested in constructing some algebra acting on the K theory on the Hilbert scheme. So I imagine this being a module over some, over some, uh, some algebra. Then I can take its tensor product with itself in a, one order, or I can take in the other order. And there'll be an operator, a non-trivial operator that that makes these two things isomorphic. It's called the braiding. It's not just the permutation of the factors. It's some other operator. And you've seen this. I, I keep referring to Professor Shriver's talk. You, you've seen this, this guy there. This is the R matrix. So this guy will satisfy the braid relation. The braid relation is, is necessary to make something a link invariant. And, and my point is that it's e so what, what, what's, what's been realized by Fadiya Fershtich and Tehtajan a long time ago from the, from the so, so uh, well, it means this is not a talk in the history of quantum groups, and there's uh, the relation between 
so nor have I prefer, prepared some eloquent statement about the history of quantum groups. But, but the relation, roughly speaking, relation between uh, R matrices and, and quantum groups is the relation between chicken and egg. You can, you can if you have, if you have quantum group, you get an R matrix. If you have an R matrix, you get a quantum group, and so on and so forth. And there, there were many, there were many iterations of this. There were many iterations of this uh, throughout the development of the subject, with uh, maybe al somehow in, on, the, on the purely algebraic side, Fadeh for Stichin and Tajan wrote maybe the more one of the more influential treatments of how starting from the R matrix you get the quantum group. And and, and geometric incarnation of that. In, the, in that book with, with Smolik, is that geometrically it's easier to construct just this operator, that this, this operator that permutes so it's a, this braiding, that, that you don't have the action yet, but you will construct the intertwiner when you, you know, take the two, two, two tensor products in one order and the other, there will be an operator that permutes them. And uh, you construct that first, and then you construct everything later. And how does this work? I mean, if you want a, a 25 cents worth of that, is suppose I have an operator. Suppose I have an operator in the tensor product in a tensor square of some space to itself. Then the the simplest thing I can do is to take matrix element in one space and get operators in the other. This is so one operator in the tensor product gives you infinitely many operators in each factor by just taking matrix elements. That, does that make sense? And moreover, you know ahead of time how these guys will commute because it's precisely the braid relation will exactly tell you how these operators will commute. You see, you can, you can, start, doing the, you can start playing this game without essentially knowing anything other than this, other than the matrix. So the, the question that was raised, the question that was raised in Professor Schreiber's talk about the, like the variety of all our matrices, well, that's essentially congruent to the question of, you know, what's, what's the variety of all quantum groups? You know, just go through this, through this, through this, uh, through this construction. And it's, you see, it, it's, it, it's, it's particularly convenient to construct objects whose generators you don't know ahead of time. You say, well, you construct one operator, and then you take some matrix coefficients. There could be, I mean, in principle, you can take them all. Of course, there'll be a, a huge overkill. There'll be, there'll be among these operators, there'll probably be some linear dependence and some algebraic dependences. You can sort this out later. And, 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 and the point I'm trying to make, that it's also true geometrically. Geometrically, it's easier to construct the braiding first, and then whatever action later. Just, just essentially going to for the first Dijkstra procedure. So, uh, so once I have so, once I have this 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 algebra, then in this algebra, I'd like to construct something which is well, it's a it's a something like a while group. It's not, it has quite a bit more adjectives, but it's, it's an object that the, 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 the value and the importance of it has been recognized by Etienne Goff and Varshenko, and I'm super happy to see Sasha here, so a uh, long time ago. So if you have uh, ordinary Lie algebras, they tend to have while groups. If you take a fine, so we have we have uh, so our algebra, so our algebra G hat. Well, you should think of this. So we have maybe I have an algebra which is G L N and two hats over it. So let me peel off one hat. So let's just have G hat where G is just G L N and with one hat. So this is an affine Lie algebra. It's, a, it's polynomials with values in some other Lie algebra. So if I have a Lie algebra that tends to have while group. If I have an affine Lie algebra that will have an affine while group. So while group was acting by, uh, while group acts by, you know, essentially some kind of reflection, like a refre reflection in some vector space, and then uh, through, you know, planes that go, all go through one point. 
uh, affine val groups, they act by reflections in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the mirrors, which now form an affine hyperplane arrangement. It means they don't go through one point. So then you go, then you go, when, when you deform, when, when you go to UQ, I mean UH bar, and you take this deformation, then instead of the wild group, you're going to get uh, some braid group, essentially, which is called the quantum wild group. And that this, this, this object you can further deform and make it a quantum dynamical affine vial group. Meaning, so again, so it has a vial group. Everybody understands what this is. You can imagine what an affine vial group is. When you take a quantum thing, it means you get this H bar in it, and instead of being a representation of, uh, instead of your reflection squaring to squaring to one, they now just satisfy the Bray relation. There's no relation like that. And then dynamical is when you get when you get that variable z in. Remember we go we started with this vertex here. Where was that vertex? Yeah. That vertex has variables q and z. And that those variables q is the, just the step of the difference equation. But the variable z that's these are new variables. Those are di what in the language of a thing of inversion, because it will be dynamical variables. So, everything I said is uh, so far is uh, somehow maybe one. How to say? There's there's one technical thing which is technically extremely important. But, but in, this, in this talk, we'll be, we will glance over it, except I'll, I'll just mention it. Is that the difference between what needed here and what's already in, in Etienne-Goff and Varshenko is the difference between katz moody Lie algebras and the kind of Lie algebras we need here. katz moody Lie algebras, they're generated by real roots, and therefore there's a reflection for every one of them. And, and here we have... Uh, something more borchardt like which means you, we have also imaginary and hyperbolic generators. And there's no classical reflections for them, so that we need something else needs to be invented. That's, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the only difference. And so, and so the way it goes is that it, you look at this, this arrangement of hyperplanes, which, which, sort of like the, which sort of like the walls of your affine uh, fine uh, wild group arrangement, and for every one of them, for every if you cross every wall, there is a there is a, there's a, a rank one subalgebra corresponding to that wall, denoted here. In in my big oh. So this Q's have to be H bar. All these Q's have to be H bar. But, uh, I apologize. So. Uh, yeah, there, there's three occurrences of Q on this page. They all have to be H bar. So uh, there's anyway there's there's a subalgebra, and and for if it happens to be UQ of SL2, you just take so the katz moody case would be when each one of those is UQ of SL2, and then you take you take formulas from Wittig of Varshenko. But in general, it could be something. And then you take and the answer is that you take some some just completely universal tensor you can associate to any braided Hopf algebra. In which you already that tensor you already can find in Tsingov and Varchenka. So you take that tensor and that's the right object to put. I'm only gonna write that tensor here. And this gives you just completely completely abstractly there's some there's something you can associate to every wall which is which would be a reflection if it were if it were uh, if it were uh, SL2 and then something else in the other case. And so what we prove is that this, this generates, this generates, this gives you an action of the braid groupoid of this arrangement, even if you have this non-real root. And then this will then contain, so the, your, 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 your braid group or braid groupoid will contain, what's a braid groupoid? It means you have a, you know, a path from here to there. And the braid group is, uh, is where you have a you know, path from, from marked point to marked point. A braid group point means you have a you know, path from, from here to there. So if, you have a, if, I, if I have, in particular, since my lattice 
is uh, tra I mean, this arrangement is, is, is invariant under the, under the translation by peak. So, so I have in particular paths that go just along the translation and you know, just go over all these walls. So it'll be, well, it's be a lattice in my braid group for it. And we'll prove that that lattice does are the lattice of operators in, in the quantum difference connection for, for, for in fact, any Nakajima variety. And so what this thing looks in an example, so let's do, let's do, the, uh, let's do the Hilbert scheme of points in, in just C2. So remember in the, where was that? So one, if, if I take this, uh, this quantum group, this, you know, somehow double loops, deformed double loops into, into JLN or acts on the K theory or the Hilbert scheme of, uh, of A and minus one surface, I want n equals one case of this means means uh, deformed loops in just JL one means in just the algebra just algebra of de deform the algebra of just Laurent polynomials in with respect to a billion algebra of Laurent polynomials with respect to the commutator, and this will act on the K theory of the Hilbert scheme of of points in the plane C two. And so. So if I take, so my, my, this will be my, my Lie algebra is with two hats, but I take PIL1 hat off, so G will be GL1 hat. So GL1 hat just loops into GL1. This is the first, the simplest Lie algebra, which is not cut smoothly in this business. And in fact, it has all integers are roots, and in fact, so there's all integers are roots of this, of this Lie algebra. They're all imaginary. And the corresponding new root operators are the operators who were constructed by Nakajima a long time ago. And they will satisfy Heisenberg relations. Now when I go to a fine situation, means I have, now I have you know, one, more, one more layer of loops. So previously I had just Laurent polynomials. Now I have Laurent polynomials in two variables. So my root's gonna look, my root's gonna look like this. So there'll be a root operator for every, uh, for every root in this lattice. And those operators were studied by many people. And if you want a particularly nice geometric description, which would be generalized the description of Nakajima operators, you can find this in a paper by Nigut. And the, each one of them, so they all satisfy each, each, each one of these um, beats, with this exact opposite beat, satisfies again the Heisenberg, the Heisenberg relation, meaning the commutator of alpha and m with the exact opposite. It's some central element minus that central element inverse, and that central element is, is, is well, it's central. And also group-like, meaning it's, co well, it doesn't matter. So, and so that previous formal, that formula, the general formula in this case is gonna specialize to the following thing. That the operator, if you want, if you want the operator in the quantum, in the, in the, uh, in this, in the connection corresponding to the shift by O of one, what you do is the following. You take, uh, a product of, you take an ordered product according to the slope of that, so you take a product of all of this, um, so, I think I have time here, so, so those were the, my root lattice were the integers in the plane. And I take an ordered product of all of this in this, in this ray. And for every one of them, this guy, this operator here, in the operator, the opposite operator, they form a Heisenberg algebra. In that Heisenberg, in that two-dimensional Heisenberg, al with this, in this Heisenberg algebra, the universal tensor will specialize to just the normal ordered exponential of, of this, of first you put the annihilation and non-creation operator, and with the coefficients, which is, has to do with the, so this, when I look at this operator, so here, so here is my operator is alpha, this would be alpha, so let's say this is creation, so this will be alpha minus one, two, three, you know the geometry, so minus three, minus two, and this is alpha three, two, so what I put is I put the normally ordered exponential of first annihilate, so alpha three, two, 
and then create alpha minus 3, 2. And the coefficient is 1 over, not, not 1 over, there's some, there's some C, C3, 2 minus C3, 2 inverse. But what comes here is 1 over Z minus 3, Q minus 2. And remember, Z is the variable that, that Z is the variable that counts the degree, and Q is the shift in the difference equation. And so, and if you if you think about this, if you if you take this product, and you take the limit, where so all this construction from all this construction, you can take the limit back into homology when you let the, the difference equation degenerate to differential equation. So then your products will become sum, and then you, you will see that how you recover the... So if you're a, anybody who's ever seen what, what quantum multiplication looks in, in cohomology for the Hilbert scheme, it's a sum sum of the operator, similar kind of expression, and you can just directly see how this product becomes that sum. All right. So, um, so in summary, so I tried to... So the course representation theory has many uses and, and, uh, and it's been used uh, in, in mathematical physics. It's been used, uh, uh, it's been used throughout its history uh, to, to, for example, I mean, one would say, uh, you know, what would be a, com what, well, no, I'm not trying to compare myself to Anzager, but, uh, but, but you should think of this as, as computation of some, so, so like Anzager's discovery was, was the discovery that that the transfer matrix of the easing model is in fact the action of some particular operator of orthogonal group in, in spinner representation. And, and here, the operator is something like the transfer matrix, and we discovered it's an action of some particular element of some particular group in some particular representation. So this is, and so in particular, if you, you, you can write, if you're interested in the solution of this difference equation, you can write a formula for the solution. The solution would be a similar infinite product going all the way to infinity. And then if you evaluate in the representation, that will be the fundamental solution. So, so uh, uh, somehow, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is an example. I mean, this falls in the general category that representation theory helps you to I don't know, diagonalize specific operators of mathematical physics or understand specific operators of mathematical physics. And in this case, it acts as a silkworm by producing, the, by producing that thread from which we can build the threefold. And of course, any time uh, uh, an animal has some commercial use, or maybe not commercial, nobody can ever make money by doing this, but, uh, but any, any time any animal can has, has some use, that has, of course, that has feed, feeds back into, feeds, you know, of course, the population of silkworm is, uh, or, you know, Somehow, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot bigger than would have been if had it not been used for to humans, and so the the, the way it fits back is uh, it it sprinkles some interest in in, in actual study of all these virtuous like algebras, which are which are slightly esoteric from the from the from purely representation theoretic point of view. They're slightly esoteric objects, but uh, uh, but 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 now people somehow you know get more and more interested in studying those because just because of the applications. Now the applications I, I didn't have time to discuss and it's the uh, uh, but there we envision many we, you know, there's nothing to report right now but it's uh, it's certainly uh, I, I keep stressing the fact that this is a block from which which many other things are built and uh, in particular Many things, many conjectures about the neutral geometry are proven like this. You, you show, you show, you, you want to prove two things are equal. Well, you, you show satisfy similar, you can, can be, you know, satisfy similar properties with respect to breaking them into smaller pieces. And then you compute, identify the pieces. Uh, so uh, the things which would, the, uh, the way, the, one of the most challenging things in Donald's and Thomas theory, in my opinion, is, is to compare the computations you do in DT theory with a certain five-dimensional computation one can do. This is some slightly, I mean, it's kind of challenging conjectures. Uh, and so then, then the, uh, of course, to, to actually identify two things, you need a similar computation on this five-dimensional side, which is currently, currently unavailable. 
but uh, on the more uh, on the more uh, on the things which is which is currently available is there 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 are various predictions about the quality of curve counts in 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 what's known as symplectical dual varieties, and so this is um, and this. Uh, uh, this, I mean, the, 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 and this is something which is accessible through this means, and and in particular, uh, the what what in specific examples what it amounts to would be like a double lab version of the level rank duality, which is, which is again some object which is you know, much studied by Sasha and his collaborators. So, um, so there's all this there's all these applications that we. I think it's, it's very reasonable to expect one can, one can uh, make progress on them. And then if you want to read about what these conjectures are, you can, you, know, you can go to this guy's web page and, and find some slides from other talks where they're discussed. And uh, with this, I conclude that's my sector of the panorama. I, I stop here. Thanks very much for the nice talk. We do have time for one or two quick questions. Wait for the micro, please. So here you show the action of this big algebra on the Hilbert scheme of uh, mm -hmm. these elementary pieces. But do there, is there a way to glue that to action on the Hilbert scheme of any threefold? Or how does that go? No, but I mean, how how does it work in 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 you know in in, in well, I don't know, say quantum field theory? You have uh, theories in d dimensions. Then the Hilbert space has to do with something which is defined in dimension one less because you impose boundary condition, right? And this, you expect that space to be to be uh, the arena, or whatever action of the operators you you want to consider. So. So you can also want, there's also some operators you can define on curves and threefold, but that would be, that would be you know some kind of higher categorical structures if you want. But it, but if you want to understand th theory in three dimensions, you should be thinking in uh, in of action of some algebras on objects in two dimensions. 